now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, coaches. My name is Jamison Miller with Championship Coaching Systems and End Zone System. I want to welcome all of you to tonight's webinar. We, uh, we're running just a minute behind getting Coach uh, Mazzoni on the line, but we've got David Marsh on here. So what I want to do is kick it off with a little bit of Q&A. Um, we'll answer a couple of questions. So if you guys want to submit those on your questions box on your webinar control panel, we'll uh, answer a couple of quick questions here while Noel gets logged in. And then we will kick it off to, to Coach to do a um, little end zone basics and philosophy and then more Q&A on the system. All right, Coach uh, Marsh, are you on? Yes, I'm here. How's everybody doing tonight? Excellent. We've got uh, we've got our first question in from Coach Toro. Okay. He wants to know on Giants, how do you determine who is the man in conflict? Does the read change from going to the single receiver side versus the three receiver side? And then what is your answer to man coverage in regards to Giants? All right, so Giants, when we first put it in as a run pass option or an RPO, depending on how, how you're going to refer to it, um, when we first put it in, we did it where we were running Giants to the three receiver side, towards the three receiver side, and they were just running a fast screen, and then the conflict player was on the back side on the single receiver side. But we haven't done that in about two years. Uh, the last couple of years, we've actually been running it towards the single receiver side. And our general rule is when we run whatever side Giants is going to, because we consider Giants an outside run, we're going to have a block on tag to that side. So those receivers or receiver, if it's to a single receiver side, will just get block on. And then the run pass option tag will be put to the side that the quarterback's actually looking at where the back is coming from. Now, as far as depicting who the conflict player is, the best way and easiest way to look at it is actually just drawing up Giants, no matter the front, whether it's a 4-2 box, a 4-1 box, a 4-3 box, which none of us should be seeing because then we should be throwing every down, which I actually really like and no old line coach is ever going to want to admit that we should be throwing. But what we're looking for is against a 4-2 box, especially when it, like, say we're in trio right or three by one to the right, single receiver to the left, and we're going to run – Giants to the single receiver. When we get a 4-2 box in an over, so the three is to the back side or the three receiver side, you're not going to run inside zone or Zorro because they're taking away the cutback, which is what we're looking for when we run inside zone and which everybody wants to run zone to the three. So when we get the three to the back, we're going to run Giants. When it's the 4-2 box, that is now the inside backer on the back side of the play, so it's to the three technique side is the guy that we're going to be re reading. Now, when you run Giants or Boss or any type of outside run play, and because you're running outside, the, back, the linebacker's rule is going to be slow, and he's going to flow, but he's going to be backside cutoff to flow over the top. So he's going to be looking to shuffle to the front side A gap and then get over the top if the ball does get outside. With that, we're going to run pop or some type of in-breaking route to replace that backer as he flows over the top. Where if we were running Zorro, we're going to run some type of stick route or some route on the outside because it's an inside downhill play and we're putting him in, in more of an in-out conflict of either get out there to your pass responsibility or stay in the box of your run responsibility. Where with Giants, you're flowing. So he's got to either flow with it or stay stationary. When he stays stationary, you're getting outside of him and you don't even have to block him. So to answer the question, and that's just a lot of detail, and hopefully everybody can hear this again, is three by one, Giants to the single receiver side, it is a backside inside backer, normally the mic. You can either call him the Sam or the nickel is widened to the three receiver side, and then the next backer will be labeled as the mic, and that's who our conflict player is. Hopefully that answers Coach Toro's question. Okay, uh, next question that came in was, how do you tag the key screens to the play side of the run game? For us, like this year, we were very beneficial, and anybody that's been in the system for a few years, 
knows that the longer that the quarterback's been in the system, the more that you can get away with and the more that you can do. Tagging key screens to the play side of a run game. So when we're so if you just go back to the basics of it, when you're in dual, you're two by two. We're gonna tag key screens to both sides. The quarterback's read is actually on the read side. So he's either reading the key the conflict player to give or throw, depending on the box, or he's gonna read the defensive end and pull it and then throw it late a la triple option. Now, on the play side of a run play, what he's looking at, and we rent, we had a lot of success against Cal doing this this year, is when they want that backside, what we would consider the backside defender, but he's actually to the play side of the run play, when he's responsible for the B gap or the A gap, but he's also responsible for the flats or hook curl or a carry defender, the quarterback's going to get a feel during the game that if he goes into the ride, that the guy's going to start playing into the B gap because he thinks that he's not being read. And our quarterback did a great job of that this year, knowing that that was his fit and coming out of it pre-snap, knowing that all he had to do is give the token fake and then throw play side. That is not a read. That's more of an actual feel to the game of knowing that he's going to have him out leveraged once the ball is snapped because the guy's going to jump back into it. He's trying to take away the pre-snap old school hot throw of just uncovered by playing out there and then running back into the box to play the run. So for us, it's actually not a play side read. That's just more of a feel of the quarterback having a, a thousand reps of 2000 reps running the same plays over and over again. Okay. Now the next one, hopefully that answers coach's question. I don't know who that came from, but hopefully that answered your question. If not, send it, send in further questions regarding that. Um, the rules for boss, um, we are not a true outside zone team or some guys call it mid zone. So when we refer to outside zone, we are talking to the guys that run variations of zone. Those guys that run inside zone, mid zone, and outside zone. Outside zone to us is just stretch. We think of it as boss. Is We are looking to get outside if we think that we can get outside on a team. If not, you're running those old bang, bounce, bang, bounce, bend rules uh, off the defensive end, which you're trying to reach. To me, this was a staple of, of my version of Knowles' offense in the end zone at the high school level. Now, we didn't try to get outside every time on it. We, be, we were reading the defensive end. The whole line is going to almost in a basic rule elephant to whatever side boss is called to. They're going to run stretch blocking. Now, with the offensive tackle to the play side does is he he's going to play off what the defensive end does well coached kids are not going to allow themselves to be reached so they're going to start running the tackle when he takes his bucket step and starts to reach the guy when he feels that he's not going to, the defensive end is not going to allow himself to be reached and he feels that run then he's just going to then the tackle will start pushing him to the sideline allowing him to just keep running now with that you don't have to have the dominant offensive tackle of hooking or down blocking or dominating somebody. He's just taking the guy where he wants to go. The back is the one that's going to make him right. The back is going to see and read that the end is running. So he's going to bang it inside there into the B gap. Now this is where he has to know the rest of the front. If it's an over and we're running it towards the three, then the next guy that he's looking at in the next gap is the three technique. Do the guard and center reach the three and get him hooked? then he can bang it up in there. If the three also runs, then he bends it back almost into the A gap out of his flat mesh. Now, the bounce rule comes in. If the tackle does reach the end, then it bounces all the way outside and becomes your sweet play all the way to the outside. This is something that we really like against odd fronts, especially 3-3 three, three stack teams. We're big fans of what we call boss or outside zone in our terminology. So for us, this has been a big play the last two years, and we've run two like two different ways of it, but we've been running outside zone against U of A because they are the only the sole three three stack team that we see in our conference and in our schedule. All right, Coach Marsh, that's uh, all the pressing questions we have right this second. 
<clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Actually, okay. Thornton just sent in. He said, do you run it out of brown and black formation? Okay. Now, we will run boss out of all formations. So when you run it out of brown or black, that depends on what type of team you are. Are you a brown and black and your quarterback's not a threat? We'll put the guy in pistol. And really, if, you're, if you want to be a brown and black pistol team, this is a great complement to the variations of inside zone of split zone and rip Liz, which is the split zone read, is now you run outside zone and you're, you're going to run boss. And you're really gonna you're gonna have a better angle to get the ball outside because the quarterback is gonna turn and run and hand the ball off to the back already with the angle off tackle, which he's still reading the defensive end. But now you use that fullback out of brown and black to seal the edge, which is the old school terminology for boss of back on strong safety. And if you do it out of one back, we normally like him in the flat mesh similar to Giants. Where he's, where he's coming across in a flat angle and he's going to read the defensive end, which is what a lot of guys refer to as mid-zone, where it's actually outside zone blocking, but the back is going to make the line correct. All right, Coach, uh, next question here, and I heard we'll have Noel on here in just a minute, guys. Um, so we'll do a couple more questions while he gets on. But uh, Coach Boyd asks, how do you attach quick game to the backside of Zorro? Would you rather call Colt and read the conflict backer? Okay, now that is one of those things that you got to start playing with and everybody's got to start playing with a little bit differently because everybody's is and every offensive guy is going to complain and everybody's going to have a gazillion stories. And I know I have a ton of them from when I was at the high school level and even in the conference and at the level that we're at now of every ref group is a little bit different. Now what you want to do in most of our run pass option stuff is we have a true conflict player and what you're trying to do is replace him, which goes back to what we were talking about with Giants. You got to know what the linebackers or the conflict player, his rules are in the run game. How is he going to fit in the run game compared to the run that you're showing? Well, when you run Giants, you know he's going to be flowing, so you got to you want to kind of replace him as he flows one way, right or left, you're going to put somebody back into his position, whether it's a slant, a pop, or somewhere in breaking route. Where when it's a downhill run like Colt or Zorro, you want to run something along the lines of a hitch or an out because he has to play downhill into his gap and then play out to his run responsibility, which to me is an in-out read off of that guy, um, which is very similar to the draw stick read. Um, or Zorro stick read is all the same thing of it's a downhill run and get him in conflict. Now with Colt, what you're doing with Colt, Colt is Zorro except for the backside tackle. If it is a five-man box, Colt and Zorro are the same exact play against a five-man box. It's when it's a six-man box that they're different. When you run Colt against a six-man box, it is a backside backer that is now in conflict because you're not accounting for him because a backside hey, Marsh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Marsh, can you hear I me? I got you. I got you. God, this is awesome, bro. Right. <laughs> What's up, coach? Nothing, man. I just I was having a little trouble with my internet. I'm I'm up here at the DC Country Club overlooking Phoenix right now. It's like seven eighty five degrees, beautiful night. And I'm thinking what better thing to do than to listen to Dave Marsh talk about end zone. <laughs> I don't know who would want to do that, but I got gotcha. you. I appreciate that one. Okay. You go ahead and go through this, Marsh, and I'll be right here. I, I, I got your back. Okay. <laughs> All right. So anyway, so with Colt, we're going we're gonna to run the same routes that we r would run with Zorro. But what you're doing, and especially with these new rules and guys, like refs are starting to adjust to these downfield, three-yard line, one-yard line, all these different rules with Colt, you're basically declaring to your offensive line of stay on the line of scrimmage and the quarterback will make you right with the run or pass. You can start running more man beaters, whether it's 93, which is fade out, or you can run slant bubble or double slant. Is you're starting to, you can start running more man beaters off of that and the quarterback's just going to go into his, into his ride off of Colt or Zorro of, it, of right in the back and then coming out of it and pulling up and snapping his hips to be able to throw those quick throws. But as far as what we've done in the past, we are not necessarily just 
tagging random quick game to the backside of a run play. All of ours is what we try to do is we try to put somebody in conflict with a pass into his pass drop area or a run into his run fit area. And that's where ours is play specific to what we're running. It's not just running boss with 93 or 91 to the other side. We're trying to put a specific player into conflict. Sorry. <coughs> All right, Dexter, you still hear me? I got gotcha. hey, you. Excellent, know excellent, excellent. I to tell you what. I'm gonna tell you what. Next week, Marsh and I are doing this again on Wednesday night. Okay. There we go. Awesome. Back to back weeks. I like it. Back to back weeks. And then we might get Bobby Acosta on here. We might have a, like an offensive staff meeting. Hey, hey Bob, Bobby's on watching right now, Coach. He's trying to learn himself. Yeah, tell tell Bobby I'm on the vodka doubles right now, so he's got trouble. <laughs> All right. So Noel, you ready so to that? turn this thing over to you? Yeah, I, I, let me see how I, you have it on my deal. I don't know how to click to the next uh, to the next slide. Probably use you your arrows on your keyboard or just click on the screen. I don't see the. Can you do it? No, I can't do it, Coach. I can just see it though. Okay. Do you see All a right, button well, up in the middle of your screen? Yeah. I don't. I, <laughs> I just lost it. Show. You want to bring showing we, screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. You can? Yes, sir. Yeah, but so I just lost my. Uh, you guys just did you guys just lose? I just I lost my um, screen. You need to go down there at the bottom and is it a PowerPoint or is it in huddle? Power. It's a. It, it's a PowerPoint. Okay. Try clicking Wait, down Marsh, on the bottom of your Marsh, screen, that big no, I think Marsh, no, Marsh had his up. It's on huddle. Oh, yeah. That, huddle. Yeah, that was Marsh's. Okay, go ahead and go ahead and pull Marsh's back up. Okay. Okay. How many, do we have anybody listening tonight? Oh, yeah, we got 65 coaches on. All right, good. All right, so let's talk a little bit about – yeah, there you go. All right, so just go ahead and uh, – Marsh, are you listening? Yes. I am. Just go ahead, just go ahead and, and click it through for me, okay? okay. Like, so I'm just going to talk a little propaganda right now. Go back, Marsh. Okay. Okay. All right. I just I read this from I read this from uh, for, uh it was on Twitter. All right. It was kind of interesting. Chip Kelly. Uh, it was like a Ch Chip Kelly quote about it's not about the scheme, it's about the attitude. Okay. And I really believe that's so so important in football and about coaching our kids and that's what we firmly believe in it's not as much as there's a hundred thousand great plays out there i mean uh, guys know a lot better plays than i know but i think it's how you coach it what you're coaching and what you what you believe in and you get your kids to believe in it all right and when they do that then i think you got something going so it's about the attitude that you attack your system with or whatever offense you're running and our and ours is it ours is that we're gonna we're gonna play with our with our with the gas pedal all the way down all right, we're not going to worry about what just happened. We're going to live in the moment. All right, and then we're going to play the next play, good, bad, or indifferent. Whatever happened has no bearing on the future. That has already happened. So we're worried about what's going on right now. So I think as we coach this system, as we coach our kids in any system, as we uh, as coaches, all right, I want to, we want our guys. I mean, I want to be a positive influence on on our guys our guys not even their football life, but also their life. You know. Because uh, the same thing happens to you. I know I'm getting kind of philosophical here, but you know I'm up here in God's country in Scottsdale, Arizona, looking at these beautiful mountains. All right, and it makes me think about this stuff. Is it something that's uh, if you have you guys, especially high high school coaches, have such a such a, a huge impact on the lives of the guys you're coaching, and that's how we want our guys to be. That hey, we're gonna we're, whatever we do, we're gonna do. We're going to go full tilt. We're not going to half-ass anything. We're going full speed, all right? Whatever happens, happen, all right? We're going to play the next play, all right? We're going to live in the moment and play the next play. So we're going to, we're not going to inherit this. We're going to create the attitude we want, all right? Go uh, yards. I got you. All right? Uh, I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah, you take it as a compliment? All right. Yep. Um, the other thing is, is it, is it um, you know, we all want to be champions, obviously, 
And so I think there's a lot of messages we can send our players that aren't just like block the five technique or run a curl wrap. I think there's other messages in there. Um, you know, I know that I think uh, Jameson stuck up on the website, you know, um, every mission matters and warrior mindset and all these all these messages you send your kids. And one of them, if you're going to be a champion, you know, I'm tired of guys that just say it. Hey, I want to be a champion. Well, what are you doing to become a champion? All right. And so one of the things we really sell our kids hard, hard is is that every time they step on the field, whether it's a walkthrough, uh, whether it's Monday practice, Tuesday practice, or whatever, is you're going to practice like – you're going to play like you practice, all right? And you want to surround yourself that are self with people that are on the same mission that you're on. And if they're not on the mission, screw them. They need to get out, all right? Sorry. All right? It's not for everybody. Okay? You can't pick and choose when you want to train like a champion, all right? You know, it's a daily process, and so we sometimes we get lot we, we we look so much at the end result we forget the process, right? And so we're huge on the process of where we want to be. You know, the every day, you know, be the same guy every day, be uncommon, all those things. All right, go, uh, Marsh. Marsh, you there? Yeah, I'm trying. There it is. Okay, so um, this is kind of this is old Paul West Westhead when he was at the Phoenix Suns. All right, is that's kind of this is how our mindset is. There's no downtime for your opponent. Right, we don't want the defense to have it. You know, now you'll see this in a little bit. Is this is kind of our big thing, Marshall and I's big thing is we don't want to play defense on offense. Okay, we don't. True want, statement. Yeah, we don't. We don't. We don't. We don't want to be those guys. We want the defense to have to defend us, and sometimes they win. All right, but well, we—they need to defend us. They don't need to dictate to us what we can run, when we can run it, and how we're going to run it. That's not going to happen. So the whole system is there's no downtime for your opponent. That's the point of the whole system, because because we're going to wear our guy, we're going to wear them down. At some point, we're going to, and our kids believe this. At some point, that defense is going to break. Okay, it may be in the middle of the second quarter. It may be in the middle of the third quarter. It may be in the last four minutes of the game. Right? If we stay the course, that defense is going to break. All right, next one, Marsh. Okay, you can go to the next one. For some of you guys, end zone members, this is stuff you you've seen or you, you've seen on the website. You've heard me talk about. But there's a lot of guys on there that tonight that aren't. All right, and, and new uh, guys, and new guys, and and Marsh and I are really about. This is, the, like, you know, this is rule number one right here, basically. Yeah, this for is grading. like. Yeah, yeah. And, and and we I don't want to sound like uh, you know like uh, like I'm Joel Steed and I'm a evangelist or whatever, but I be a way of life. This is how we live, all right, every day, all right. And one of the one of the the things that we harp hard on our kids is the, how they finish, all right. And this means how they finish everything they do in their life. All right? It happens to be in football that we can watch it on film and we can grade you. And this is one of the things that we that one of the only things that we actually grade our kids on. We don't really grade on assignments and all those type of things. That's a position coach deal. But as a coordinator, you know, I'm, what I look at is how are our guys finishing? All right, how are they playing? All right, next one. Okay, keep going. This is all stuff that's on the site. All right, so here's the three major things for, for, for the system. All right, now, and it's not like we invented this shit. It's just how we feel. All right. Number one is we're trying to create space. Okay. We don't want to play in a phone booth. All right. We want to put we want to put conflict on the defense. So to put conflict on somebody, you put them in space. Now, if you want to if you want to go two tights, eye, power eye, or whatever. All right. And the and the Mike linebacker knows he has the a gap. All right. He has no conflict. Okay. We want to spread them out. And we want to get him where he has to to cover space on the football field, okay? So with that, we create conflict, okay? And the next thing we want to do is we want to create this conflict with tempo, all right? So to keep tempo, we have to be simple, all right? We have to have a few schemes. We have to we have to know these schemes. Our kids have to have ownership of these schemes, and then we have to play these schemes with tempo, all right? So we put, we're always putting pressure on the defense to make quick decisions, to get to the curl drop, to fill the A gap, to get to the curl flat, to you know, to cover the swing pass. If they're blitzing, to fill the right gap. I want those guys. I want the defense always in conflict and in being in conflict with tempo. All right, Marsh. 
All right, so the whole thing is built on this that we already talked about. We don't want to play defense on offense. And you know what, guys? Sometimes they win on defense. Sometimes they stop you. I think I, here's here's an interesting stat: is we were about we were below the middle of the pack in the Pac-12 in tackle for losses. All right, but we led the Pac-12 in explosive plays. Okay, so it's it's one of those famine, famine, feast deals sometimes. Okay, is that sometimes they win. All right, well we're not going to play defense and say, well we can't run that play anymore. They got us on that one or whatever. We're going to fix the problem, still play with space, and we're still going to we're still going to keep being attacking offense. All right, we're going to get the ball to our playmakers in space, and you all have those kids on your team. You got that one or two kids that you know that when you put the ball in their in their hands in seven on seven. Or in dodgeball, that's a kid that never gets hit by dodgeball, right? All right, you put the ball in his hands out in space, okay? He can't get tackled, so we're always looking to put our, the ball, the ball in our playmaker's hands in space where we develop a one-on-one -on -one tackle with him in a safety, him in a corner, him in a linebacker. All right. It's fast. All right. We don't coach a lot during practice, all right? We're worried about a couple things. Finish, we're worried about tempo, we're worried about turnovers. You know, we're worried about things that, that we can coach on the run, all right? Um, we don't have very many schemes or concepts uh, in our passing game, so we don't change the play or the schemes much, all right? We'll just change the presentation to the defense. We can run the same play with all the same schemes out of trio, all right? To me, trio and green tear are the exact same deal. Okay, everything stays the same for my guys, but it's a different look or a different presentation to the defense. Okay, we want to always protect our plays as you build your offense. All right, then protect your players. All right, if you're putting your players in hard situations that they have to dig out a safety or they have to hold a, a stock block on a corner or they have to, you know, foos or, or or the tackle has to get down and and cut off that backside wheel backer on Zorro, all right? So you're, to protect your players, you have to have plays to protect them, plays that make their job easier, all right? Think players, not plays, and then play the next play, fix the problem. So these are the things that our kids understand that we keep harping on them. It's, this is us. This is who we are. All right, Marsh. All right, so we're built on this, but this is to me how, you, what, how what the key to the success is. All right, number one is is that um, that our guys have to believe they're on a common purpose. That they they take ownership, they take ownership in their in their offense. And so, in other words, to me, that means that a guy's not just doing his job. All right, he does his job understanding how it fits with the other ten guys. Okay, he's running a flat route. Why? All right. He's running the post Y. He's running the dig Y. He's blocking the three technique Y. Okay? How does that fit to what we're doing? And so I think one of the great things you can do is is involve your players. Instead of being that guy that stands up in front of the whiteboard and just draws plays and tells guys they, this is how you step and all this stuff, is to involve your players in what – in the team meetings, in the position meetings, in the offensive meetings, involve them in practice, give them jobs to do, give them breakdowns, you know, those type of things, all right? So so get them involved. Let them take ownership in what you're doing, all right? They have to obviously have, have tremendous trust, all right? With uh, Coach Mora and we're all, we're big on every day we can, we sell the team, not to me, all right? And I know everybody does that, but, it, but it's huge. Is it like I just read a – thing about um, the the defensive coordinator at Florida uh, Collins today was I thought was interesting is in spring practice all right and we do this too we call it the uh, we, we call it the uh, power of the high five all right is it is it you actually practice celebrating okay when you make a big play as an offense all right you know you got to teach your guys well how are you gonna you know let's celebrate all right, so it's not just about you; it's about the team. It's about all ten, all eleven guys being in the end zone, celebrating together. Okay, so that you know that anything you can do to to, to fortify team team you know team ego. Okay, accountability. This is your job. All right, this is what you're supposed to do. You got to be held accountable. 
I have to be held accountable. Marsh has to be held accountable. Jameson has to be held accountable. Your right tackle has to be held accountable. All right? Uh, be the uncommon man, competitive greatness, and extreme toughness. So these are all the keys to me of not so much what the plays we're running, but the mindset of how we're running these plays. All right, Marsh. All right, now how do we create our tempo? And and, and I tell you, a guy, if you uh, the guy to talk to that's 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 uh, studded all this stuff is Marsh, is uh, Coach Marsh. All right, now, he understands all this. He's been at the high school level. He's been at you know all the different levels. He came to us. I mean, he's a great asset for us. Um, and he really is a, a great conduit between you know you say well you're college football, you got a hundred guys, all this kind of stuff. Heck, he was winning championships with 19 guys running tempo offense. So he's a great conduit for you guys to talk to and to bounce ideas and, and, and ask questions about, you know, how can I practice like this when I've only got 24 guys on my football team or 30 guys and half of them play defense. But you got to have an efficient way to communicate. That's number one. You can't be a good offense if you can't communicate. All right. So in other words, your guys have to open their mouth, all right? You can't be the only guy talking at practice. Okay? They have to talk to each other, all right? They have to tell each other. You know, They have to be able to say, hey, I got the crew. You got the flat. They have to understand how it all fits together and be able to communicate and talk back to each other. And then you've got to be able to, to have a way to efficiently signal, all right, what, what you know, a way to so that you can play fast, an efficient way to get the play to your 11 guys, get it communicated, and get it snapped in as short of amount of time as you can. All right. One of the main, one, one of the only ways you can do that is you got to be able to keep it simple. All right. Here's the base concepts. If we run caddy and you're the F, it doesn't matter if I line up in trio, dual, green, blue, whatever. This is what you always do. That that kid can play fast now. All right. If you're the Y, this is what you always do. Okay, if you're the back, this is what you, whenever you hear that that code word, doesn't matter what formation I'm in with what motion. You this is this is you always you're doing the same thing. All right. Um, receivers find grass and take you know you talk to Marsh about that. All right. Um, quarterback has, has progressions, so as you train your quarterback, all right, you need to train your quarterback. All right, not only in the passing game but in the run game that his eyes and his feet. All right, is what what works his progression. He can't just train. All right, look at you know, look at this. You got to train. Okay, how the feet work, how the eyes work. All right, so most of practice, I'm watching my quarterback's head. Where is he looking? Okay, is he guessing or is he, does he know what he's looking at and where is he looking? Okay, effective substitution. You know, you got to get guys in and off the field. Got to get the old line up. We're gonna try something this spring and, and signal to the center and let him communicate the plays to the O lineman and then, um, you know, give the ball back to the ref. I mean, it's all the little things that, that enable you to play, fa play fast. All right, Marsh. Okay, so that, this is how we play, all right? We create our attitude, okay? We, we, we want to create our swag. I mean, I, I think Marsh, you know, I even went down to CVS and bought, like, two cases of, of Old Spice swag to hand it yep. off to our kids. All right, just to tell them, hey, if you if you don't have your swag today, here, spray some spray some of this shit on here, because now you can now you got swag. Not come to practice, okay? So every day they come to practice, man, bring your swag, bring your attitude, okay? You're gonna play like you practice, okay? You're gonna play with tempo. You're gonna play the next play, okay? They gotta keep hearing that stuff over and over and over and over again. When you think you've heard them, they've you think they've heard it enough, tell it to them again, okay? No downtime for your opponent. Practice fast, play fast, play the next play, fix the problems, protect our plays, protect our players. Fat, focus fast, finish. Okay? So this is how we want to play. Okay? Whether good or bad, whatever happens in that that play that we just ran, all right, this is how we want to play. All right, Marsh. Okay, I know a lot of you guys have, have you know, I've been at clinics with you guys or or you've you've been, you know, you've run the system for a while, but this is um this is our only goal, okay, that we have have for every practice in every game, okay. So we are what we call a 12% rule, okay. So all the only thing that we really coach or that we when we when I show when I show our our offense as a as a whole as a group, 
These are the only, I don't look at, hey, you should have gone right and you went left, or you stepped six inch step instead of eight inch step, or, you know, all. These are the things that I point out to our guys. This is what win. To me, there's two things that win and lose football games. One is this turnover sacks, drop balls, and foolish penalties. Okay. And the other one is situational football, third down and red zone. Okay. Those are the things that win and lose football games. First and second down, all that other bullshit is bullshit. Just call plays. Okay. So we're trying to keep this number under 12% for the total number of plays that we ran in practice or in the game. All right. So we add those things up, divide by the number of plays, and our kids know that we need to be under 12% number of times that we've had these things happen to us in the course of a practice or a game. And this spring, I'm even giving this to the players. I'm, I'm having a, one of my players be the turnover captain, another be the sack captain, and one be a drop ball captain, and a foolish penalty captain. And I'm going to let those guys all right, grade, grade the offense over spring ball and show them the cut up and say, Hey, look at here's a turnover, here's a sack, and here's a reason why. You know, so that goes that pushes right back to ownership of the offense. All right, next one. Okay, go to the next one, Marsh. Next. Next. Okay, I tell you what, I'm gonna stop right there, and then before I move on, hey, Jameson, is there any way to get questions? Ask questions. Yes, sir, Coach. Uh, yeah, Coach. Marsh, if you have Jameson, if you have questions right now, guys, go ahead and type those in. Are there any questions? No, I don't have any questions. So, there's no questions right, right now. What you just went over, but we'll give the guys a minute here, and they can type them in. Okay, so as they're typing them in, go to the next one here. Okay. Okay. So just basics. Yeah. So this right here is just all. You know, I know some of you guys are new to it, right? But, you know, we're always thinking about how do we how do we play fast, all right? And how it basically to me, you know, Coach Marsh, is it Don't every do it. formation? Okay, every formation <laughs> we run is either one of two things: you're either in a two by two or a three by one, or you're building a two by two and a three by one. Okay, and I'm gonna let Marsh get on here in a second and. Uh, Marsh, are you ready to pull up some run conflict stuff, like off of Giants or something? Uh, I can. I can easily adjust to that if that's what we want to go to. Uh, I was waiting to see where where this headed with talking about the basic philosophy of it and talking to some of the guys and see how many new guys we have okay, before so, we go into the advanced part so, of it. Uh, let me just give a quick overview of what I feel the base of the offense is after we talked about all that other good shit we just talked about. All right, you know about attitude, about tempo, about you know, you know, play the next play, uh, you know, hunt or be hunted. That's our new one, right, Marsh? Yes, sir. And Coach, yeah, I do have a question for you here from one of the members. Okay. Okay, go ahead. He asked, when you say protect your plays and protect your players, can you please explain that further? Okay, so let me – I'll give you some examples, all right? I'll give you a protect your play, protect your player play, okay? So you're running green tear Zorro. Or green tear Zelda Zoro odd. You're green, running green tear Zoro odd comet. Okay, so that's a base play for us. Okay, we're gonna run that play. I mean, I don't give a shit. That gets run every game, every practice, all the time. Okay, it's like Stanford running power. Okay, that's a, that's our play. All right. Well, which is which is which is uh, zone read. All right, to the left, and which is the bubble screen to the right with a gift on the backside. Okay, so that's a base play for us. So now you take your base play, all right? And now number one is I've got to protect that play. Well, how do you protect plays? Okay, well, you protect plays is you start building off that play. You start building in your under screen, your screen, your Rose and Linda. You start building in your play action, you know, green, tear, ride, caddy, all right? You start building in uh, rocket and laser screens, okay? Your swing screens. So you're protecting that play. All right, so the defense just has to so the defense has to defend more than just a zone read and the bubble screen and a hitch on the backside. They have to defend other things, so that protects my play. Okay, now if I'm protecting my players, say I'm throwing that that bubble screen out there, and I got the corner, they're rolling down to cover three, and the freaking strong safety is rolling down on that tear motion, and he is just blowing my Y up, or it's cover two. And the corner's playing hard, and he's jumping inside the 
the the Z receiver on the bubble screen and make it an impossible, you know, for that Z to block that guy for the bubble screen. Okay. Well, so let me digress a little bit here. So if to, I don't want to play defense on offense, so I'm not going to say, oh, shit, see how the corner's playing? I can't run that play anymore. Okay. I want to protect my players from doing their job. Okay, so they have a dot job to do it. If the defense is making it hard for do, doing their job, then they're giving me something else. So now my answer is green tear. All right, show. Now I might I might throw a, a comet lock post. Okay, so I might I may throw a route off that same look to protect my player's ability to block the the comet screen. Marsh, did that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. And so, well, yeah. Go ahead. If you have to interject, so, so go ahead. No, like so, like going to the protect the players thing, and to me, this is the one thing that coach does that I wish I would have done a little bit better at the high school level is is the play caller on the field. You're interacting with your kids and get, and it goes back to everything that coach was just talking about of knowing the system and knowing your players and protecting your players and protecting plays as you're running green tear Zoroad comment. Well, to protect your players when your Y or your Z is getting blown up. Well, if your Y is getting blown up because a strong safety or the nickel is charging outside, you you teach them to be able to call cab, which is the automatic cross block between the Y and the Z. Well, if they're still blowing it up, that's when you run the lock comment or the lock post, which is the play action or the fake off the sw off the screen, and then you run some type of two vertical concept down the field. Now you're going to keep those guys from really hard charging, taking away the the comet screen or the fast screen or whatever with the bubble screen whatever you're throwing is now they're not getting the crap kicked out of them on every play because now they're up, they have to be weary of some type of two vertical concept or some type of play action and that's where the protecting your players comes in is you're protecting them from the physical stuff that comes along with the game and this is where your kids take command and ownership which again coach touched on the ownership of the system the kids can come to the sideline and say coach Hey, hit him with a lock. Hey, if you come back and hit Comet one more time, we have lock on him the next time we run it. And the kids do this throughout the game because they've run it so much, they know when they have the opponent ready to run some type of lock or play action. That's a good – that was a nice job, Marsh. I appreciate that. Yeah, not bad for a D-line coach. No kid. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, any more questions, Jameson? Yeah, Coach. Anderson. Um, we got a question here. <clears throat> Coach McGill asked, "What is your number one foundational concept?" Our number. Okay, we have. Okay, you're talking. If you're talking run or pass. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna do both. Okay. So there's two base. There's probably three pace runs for us. Okay. One is a zone read. Now there's different variations. You can like Marsh was talking earlier. You can go Colt and base the backside, or you can go ahead and you know, treat it like a true zone read where you're read, reading the conflict guy in the will or the, if there's six in the box, the conflict guy in the end, okay? And there's Giants, which is the pin and pull for us, which to me protects, all right, Zorro. And we talk about protect our plays. It protects Zorro. And the third one's probably our draw, which is a full draw, Detroit. Okay, so those, those are probably the three base concepts that teach our kids, you know, everything they need to know in the offense. I did teach them how to how to run zone, okay. Teach them how to run a pin and pull scheme and stretch the ball, and teach them how to run a inside fold scheme, okay. So everything's kind of based off that, all right. In the passing game, all right, we always start with our snag game, all right. Either a two man snag game Exxon or a three man snag game Chevron. Now there's variations off it, but that's where it all starts, okay. Now these are ways you chew that you uh, protect your play by affecting the conflict backers. In about one minute right here, I'm going to let Marsh get on here, okay, and, and show you some examples of conflict backers, all right, how we deal with conflict backers. But think of it this way. You have five offensive linemen, okay. You, you want those guys, to, if they're an even front, okay, you want those guys to be able to put hats on the four down line guys and a mic, let's say, okay. So now that leaves a Will and a Sam to me that are conflict guys. Those are the guys we're affecting. Those are the guys that we're playing the game off of. Because we know the line who they got. All right, that's a hat on a hat, five on five. Okay. So the sixth and the seventh guy are the guys that, that we're controlling. All right, with with our snag game, with our with our run pass concepts, with 
you know, play action with any of those things. Because those are the guys, those are the only guys that you, they can add into the box to help them stop the run. Now, we've had the leading rusher in the Pac-12 two out of the last three years. And it's not because we run a lot, you know, that we're a great run team. She said, I think we do a good job affecting or controlling the sixth and seventh guy to try to get their hats in the box, you know. And so I think it's a good time right now for uh, – is there any more questions first, Jameson? Is that – uh, no, sir, Coach. Yeah, this is a good time. Marsh, you think you could jump up real quick and pull up a, a run and a run pass conflict to show the guys? Okay, let me see what I got. Have you got Giants and White Pop? Uh, I have Giants and then White Pop. I don't have them in one one thing. Yeah, once you do, once you okay. do Giants. Okay. Okay. And then and then show them the white pop how we how the that, to me that's easy well that either that or Detroit but this will be good okay, okay. Yep. yeah you want me to take it or you got it yeah you got it you got it you got okay it. all right so Giants for us is our base pin pull scheme um, it is stretch on the front side can possibly be pin pull uh, backside is automatically pin pull and then you read the sixth defender. Now you can run it two different ways. If you have a quarterback that's a runner, you can have your tackle automatically go through to the second level and read the defensive end, or you lock the defensive end and read the linebacker on the back side because that is now the unblocked player. Now when we talk about stretch on the front side with pin pull, you can treat it like true buck sweep where it's automatic, automatic rules. If you have a guy in your down gap, you're on a down block, and then the next guy is automatically on a pull, and then their, their rules sort themselves out based off who the first puller is, or you automatically put it on the tackle is going to base out on the front side, and then all the down blocks happen from there on out. Uh, we've done it both ways, and we actually go into games where we'll alternate between what we're doing, and we just have different calls based off of what we're getting on the offensive front. Um, and this is just, that's a hard view to look at it, but this is what the, the players will get nowadays. Um, is we'll just take screenshots of our opponents and draw it up each week against what they're going to look, and it really helps the offensive line. So you're going to see right here, it's an, they're going to declare it a 4-1 box. So this guy, and I don't know if you can see my arrow, but the yeah, guy on the, right, on the right side, outside the defensive end, is not being accounted for by the offensive line. So they're going to account for four down to Mike. They're going to be, they're going to base the front side. They're, the tackle is going to make the me call that he's got him. So he's going to base out the three technique. The, the center knows that he's got a guy on his downside, so he's going to down block him, which leaves the guard to pull around. We are going to skip pull on this so they can insert whoever the puller is in the skip pull so he can insert wherever the hole opens. So because he's got a base block by the guard and a down block by the center, he knows that he's probably going to insert right here in the front side A-gap. If this does close, say you get a pirate or some type of slant by the three technique across the guard's face and he ends up down blocking him, the guard now, because of the skip pull, can go all the way around and insert in the B gap or the C gap, depending on what type of stunt that he gets. But he knows which guy that he's accounting for with the skip pull and his eyes will be on him. Now the back, his steps will be the same way. He is going to skip release so he can stay on the backside hip of the guard so he can insert in that front side A gap or go all the way around, depending on what he gets. Same thing when you're going to the shade. Both backside guys are going to base because they have guys down from them. Now the front side guard is, has the guy in the gap down from him, so he'll down block in the center will fold for that play side backer. 4-2, same rules. Now the backside guard knows that he's pulling for the front side backer, which is declared by the center's front call. Now with that, this backside backer, depending on if you're going to send the tackle through or you're going to base, if you're going to base, this becomes a conflict player for the quarterback. And that's who you have to replace. And just like I was talking about at the top of the uh, session, is when he gets a flat mesh and he gets this type of run action, his rules is going to be fill to, to flow over the top of it, and he's going to be the backside cutoff for everything. So he's going to be moving laterally across the play. Well, if his rules are to move laterally, we're trying to replace him with a throw right in here in the middle of the field because then that's putting him in conflict. Same thing against a different front. And nothing changes. They just know if they have a guy down from them, they're in the down block. 
odd. In most odd cases, it's going to turn into buck sweep. And this in this diagram, you're going to see that the center calls for the down block by the guard. So he's going to be down. Now the center and the backside guard are both pulling. What you can do is if you have a really good center or you just don't feel like having the down block because you want your guard out, you can base the center. And now you turn it into a buck sweep where both guards are pulling. And we should have a few examples of that, actually, just like right here, where the center takes him and then both guards are pulling, and now this backside backer is the conflict player. And most times, just to touch on it, this frontside guard, when he's a puller, he almost automatically knows he's going to have some type of kickout block because they're going to get some type of edge guy, a force defender that's going to show up and try to keep, turn the ball back inside. So he's going to end up on some type of trap block. And then the backside guard is still going to have his same type of read of skip pull and then insert where the first hole shows up. Okay, here we go. Let's see which one we got in the first one. Okay, 3-3 three, three stack team. Now this is a little variation that we use for them, just a little don't change the play, change the presentation. So we're still running giants to the right, back to the single receiver. We're just going to motion them back out, try to out leverage them or try to get them to move the conflict player out and we're going to run quarterbacks giants right here. Okay. Let me go back. Maybe. Back motions, conflict player starts to move with him right here. Quarterback feels that guy move just a little, just enough. Both both pullers skip pull, release and it turns into true buck sweep. One more time. Back a little bit further. Both guys go. Quarterback reads the conflict player all the way around the edge. You get the end zone view for you right here. You're going to see it. So we're going to base the defensive end on the play side. He doesn't have anybody yeah, down move, from him. Move, He's the center is called the, the nose. Go so, with the conflict guy, Marsh. Okay. Yep. So this guy's pulling to kick out or turn the corner. Center's got the, uh, the nose. Backside guard's pulling. Backside tackle's basing. So we're going to pull, eyeing this guy by the first puller and pulling for the, with the second puller for this guy, which leaves this as the sixth defender in the box, which is now the quarterback's guy. And we teach our quarterback is that is a conflict player because there's no lineman that can account for him in the blocking scheme. So it goes back to the old option rules and the, just the old base gun rules a uh, five-man box run, which means you need to account for the sixth guy with, with the quarterback, or six-man box, the quarterback's going to read somebody. Well, it's a six-man box, so the quarterback is now reading that defender, depending on what he do, does. He expands, so the quarterback knows that he is now running the ball against a five-man box. Get more of a traditional look right here. Okay, three by one to the boundary. Five-man box, but going into the week, we knew that they were going to bring somebody down when it was three by one to the boundary. So the line should be accounting for this guy on, on the edge right here, which leaves this guy is the quarterback's conflict player. Doesn't feel that he can make the play on the run play. Gives it off. First puller out. Long trap on the, on the edge uh, force defender that shows. Goes up. Single receiver blocking. One more time. Okay, so three down. The line is accounting for these two backers, which is their five down linemen. Base the end, down block, center pull. He knows he's got the first guy out. Backside guard is accounting for this Mike Backer right here, and quarterback has the will on the backside. And to me, this is a perfect example for all us high school guys out there of you don't have to have dominant players to be able to run this scheme because watch the center right here on a linebacker just kind of gets in his way, doesn't even actually have to block him, just get in his way and springs the play for a touchdown.
We'll get to the end zone copy to show that there's not, it's not necessarily that it's physical dominance. It's getting in guys' ways and freaking just running it over and over again and letting the quarterback make the right decision, putting the ball in your playmaker's hands and freaking scoring touchdowns off of this just by running it over and over again. Hey, Coach March, I've got a Almost couple of questions. Almost all position blocks right there. Okay. You, you want to address those now or you want to wait? Sure, we can go over those. Okay, so on the first 4-1 slide, were you reading the front side linebacker? Uh, no, you're reading the back, back side, side from where the back the back is coming from. All right. Uh, do you ever read a front side linebacker on Giants? We do not. He is part of. If he is accounted in the box, then the linemen are taking care of him. If he's not accounted for and he shows up, then we have to have something to take care of him on the front side with either motion or some, a different play to take care of him on the front side. But if we know, especially in a 4-1, and that backer is to that side, we need to start taking advantage of him with the quick throws to the single receiver then. Okay. Uh, next question here is, so on QB Giants, if the conflict backer does not run – with the running back motion, does he throw to him? Yes, if and that's a gen, that's a base rule when you put in whether it's green blue tear, green blue fast, or dual or trio travel, any type of backfield motion which throw it right now. It's an automatic throw. It, there, there's not even a read on it anymore. That's just pre-snap uncovered. You're adding somebody to that area, and nobody's accounting for him, so throw the ball. Hey, Marsh, why don't you pull up a white pop, and kind of, you can kind of show him better. Okay. I'm seeing that. So pop uh, right here is a little, uh, somewhat of an example, just like what Coach is talking about with, with Trio is just like Green Blue Terror is you got a three by one, whether the back is in the backfield and fast motions over here and he ends up in the flat just like the F receiver does, is the farthest receiver, our Z, is going to block MDM corner to the next defender inside, and the most inside receiver is going to run the pop route off of that sixth defender, which is now in run conflict right here. You got a you got a video of it? Yeah, I'm going to it right now. Uh, let's see. There you go, right there. You just had it. Okay. You want this one out of the fungo look? Okay. Gotta go back one. The first one is the this key is to. Yeah, go back to the SC one. Yeah, right here. Okay. This is a good. No, the next one. Next one. Okay. Here we go. Go ahead, coach. I'll just keep, I'll run it. Okay, so stop. So we're building trio, right? You're building two by two by one or three or two by two or three by one. So the line knows three down. Go ahead, Marsh pointed out. Is there basin and they're pulling for the wheelbacker? Okay, and the the jack. Is that they call that the jack? Yes. I don't know what the hell they call that guy. We anyway, call it the jack. The wheel and the jack. So the <laughs> so the conflict guy, okay. Show the conflict guy. All right, the conflict guy. That's who Brett's looking at. Okay, now we want to replace him with a route. So we're gonna run what we call a pop route into that space. So what Brett's looking is if this guy matches the back, then I pull and I throw the pop. If somebody covers the throw pop, throw the comet or throw the fungo or throw the, the receiver screen outside of it. You wanna run it? You're buffering. Okay. Yep. One more time. As you're going to see, this is a conflict guy. You're going to see him flow to the run play, and this is who we're trying to replace with some type of in-breaking route into his defensive pass void.
Is yours jumping around like this too? No. Mark? No, it's not? No, but I'm, okay. I'm getting Mark. messages that it is, though, so I'm going to let it play a few yeah. times so you guys can try to see it. Yeah, Coach, our video quality is not very good on here. All right, Marsh, you're on your own. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. Marsh, you're on your own. Okay. I got to go. Yes, sir. Okay, let me see if I can find the clean, fast motion one. Okay, here we go. Three by one to the boundary. We got a four down front, trying to play the three to the back. The line's going to count for this is the, is the fifth guy in the box that they're going to block. So the quarterback's going to read this guy for conflict. We're going to replace him with one of these receivers on an in route, and the other two will be on a screen. Flow, replace. And as you see, each version of this is a little bit different, and this is where you take your best dodgeball player, best basketball player, best soccer player. I love soccer players at wide receiver because they have natural feet and they just have natural feel for finding this grass right in here. Is we count, This is a run play to us. We're calling a run play, and we're gaining nine yards off a little pitch and catch. Okay, 11 yards. And to point it out in case any defensive coaches are watching, we have one guy at two yards downfield. Get to the end zone view. Okay, so end zone, we should get base down since he has a guy in his down gap. Center should be pulling, and both guard and tackle should be basing the end and the three technique out. He might be sifting, and depending on what the call is, but it should be two base blocks, and the quarterback should be responsible for 47. And as you see, he didn't get the right call, or we actually tagged it wrong is maybe the quarterback's actually supposed to be reading 41 right here, and his eyes might be on that guy, depending on the call. But as you see, the backside guard is now pulling for 10. Actually, that was a frontside guard right there. They actually just full zone that one. Okay, here we go. Maybe. Here we go. I know but I can see the buffering starting to kick in. He's just starting to screw, screw up my screen. Okay, four down to the play side backer. Is who the line's accounted for. Quarterback already knows pre-snap. If this guy's going to start all the way in the A-gap, I already know that I'm going to hit this guy on his slant, pop, whatever in-breaking route that we have tagged. He already knows, so he's going to give a little token fake. And you see that the back is not even across his chest yet, and he's already coming up to throw. Wide receiver just finds a void. Slow play, find the void, throttle, not coming to a stop, but not running full speed, just finding that void. Show it one more time, then we'll go to the end zone view. The end zone, four down to 41. As you see, 52 doesn't even get out of his stance. He's taking the wrong steps right here. Should be down blocking 11. Completely messes it up, but it's still a positive play and turns into a touchdown for us. 
But as you see, you can even see the backside tackle right here is almost in like just an aggressive pass pro. Just lock the guy out, and he doesn't even have to do anything, and the play's already over, and it's a touchdown for him. A couple more times in case the buffering's been bad. All right. Um, it's 7 o'clock now, at least my time. Um, let's go into some more questions, whoever's got stuff. Um, so to me, like for those that don't know me, I was a high school coach. Got into coaching because of Coach Miz or the college level because of Coach Mazzoni. I ran his offense at the high school level. Uh, I've worked his camps. I've worked a lot of clinics, a lot of glaziers. Picked it a lot up from there, and then becoming a system member. Um, to me, one of the best things I've ever learned from Coach Mazzoni, and even a lot of the guys, is Coach referred to it as a lifestyle. Um, it is to run this type of system, and 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 really to run any system whether it's Paul Johnson at Georgia Tech and Navy running the flex bone, whether it was Air Force running the flex bone for all those years, is guys that run systems is they go back to the fundamentals and the basics every year. And that's what, when we were talking about putting the schedule together for webinars, is that's what we, is, as coaches, we got to go back to, is you got to go back to the beginning of it every year and start from the beginning. Don't just look for the next step. Don't look for the next stage. Don't let, look for the next popular play. Go back and look at your system and this system and find ways to refine what you're doing because there's always something that you can pick up that you didn't hear the year before. There's little things on the conflict player I always hear Coach Mazzoni talking about that's a little bit different every time I hear him talk. There's a little bit different ways that I hear, shoot, it took me two and a half years before I ever realized that green-blue terror is the same thing as trio to coach. Shoot, he said it on here, but how many times – have you heard him say that? Because he says it almost every clinic before it actually sinks in that when you're building plays, it is the same thing and the same look to your opponent and to your quarterback that you're basically able to give different looks, but it's the same thing for your quarterback and you're creating the same conflict player. And to me, that's the thing about this is you got to go back and go back and study your notes from clinics this year of the clinic season that it just ended or the end zone private clinics or the webinars or go back to what's on the website and study the stuff that's on there all the way back to when it first went online a few years ago and coaches talking about philosophy and how when like one of the questions that came up was what is your base play that starts all of it well when you look at all of it inside zone five man six man pass pro and the base pass play are all the same thing the pass pro and the run play are tied for the line that it's the same look for them but the pass play reads are the same as the run pass play reads when you first put the offense in. And that's something you got to go back and look at every year to make sure that you're teaching it to your players right. Maybe you've gotten so used to the system that maybe you're skipping it over when you're teaching that new sophomore, new junior quarterback that's about to take over your system. I'm listening to college guys that run this. And they are gonna, they're having a quarterback battle, but it's between a retro freshman and a true sophomore. So they're the same class. Well, he's starting from the beginning again, just like he did last year with a three-year starter, is he's going back to the beginning. And that's something that this, to me, was important for all of us to go back and listen to. But enough of me standing up on the soapbox about freaking what we need to do as coaches of going back to the beginning and learning. Jameson, do we have any more questions that have come up, whether it's about the plays that we were talking about or the system in general? Yes, sir, Coach. All right, uh, this one's from Coach Thornton. He said, when you, and this is referring to what you were talking about a couple of minutes ago. He said, when you send a tackle through, don't you give up the run pass option or put yourself in danger of a legal man downfield? Or do you tag a key screen or something behind the line of scrimmage? Normally, when we, if we're going to do it off of Giants with a tackle through, Normally, we're going to run it with a true like fast screen to the outside. We're not normally going to have a, a downfield pass off of it unless we know that we're getting like game plan wise. And it's a little bit easier for us because defenses at our level normally have a complete fingerprint and aren't as uh, chaotic as they are at the high school level. I think there's some high school coaches that just kind of make stuff up when they play offenses like this and they – the defensive ends aren't as well trained to me. Like when we put for us wrapping it back around is if we get a hard scrape exchange team where the tackle is or the D 
defensive end is going to pin the hip and try to chase the tackle. When we get that, we know that the backside backer is going to flow all the way around and try to tackle the quarterback. So we know that the tackle can just down block or sift block and then lock out the end late because we're going to get the hard scrape exchange and we can normally create the throwing lane with that scraping linebacker because the end is now the actual read. When you sift or you're going to send your tackle through, the end becomes a read. It's no longer the linebacker because now the linebacker is accounted for by the offensive line. But that's more of just when you get those hard scrape exchange teams, that's a big change up for us that we like to do against them. Now, if they're not a scrape, scrape exchange team or you don't know what you're going to get, to me it's just like when you tag Colt or tag Giants where you're, tag, you're going to base the defensive end is read that linebacker and let him either fill off the two di the out blocks and the base block by the guard and tackle and let him fill thinking it's some type of lead play or let him just automatically scrape over the top thinking that he's getting some type of zone read and then you you have him either way because then he's taking himself out of the run play which is at the end of the day what we want to do we've been in the top three in rushing yes we've had the leading rusher two out of the last three years but we've also been in the top three rushing as a team in a conference the last three years that the staff's been at UCLA. Excellent, Coach. All right, this one comes from Coach Boyd. Hopefully that answers your question, Coach Boyd. Uh, Coach Boyd asks, what are some coaching points for the running back on Giants with two pullers? So, well, his base rule is he's going to skip into the handoff, so he's going to skip and then cross over um, into a, into the handoff or to the mesh point with the quarterback. He's trying to stay on the backside hip of the backside puller. Well, he already knows that, and he and this is where he has to learn the fronts, and your running back coach has to do a great job of teaching him the fronts. If he's got a three backside and he's got a three to his side, he already knows that the backside guard isn't going to be the puller that the center will be the puller. So he can speed up his skip a little bit. But if he's got a shade or a one or a nose of that side, he knows that the guard is going to be pulling, that he can really get into the skip and stay behind that backside guard. This is where teaching the game of football, you, we still have to do it. It's not just giving them a bunch of plays and expecting them to go do it. Still got to teach them to read the fronts and tell them, okay, this is the guy that's going to be pulling and teach them the blocking scheme because then it also tell, it clears their mind on where the hole should open up. Excellent, Coach. All right, uh, next question here is, if you run Giants with a tight end, does the conflict guy change since you have more blockers? It now just becomes the seventh guy in the box. So against five, it, it's a, it, the base rule is you have five linemen so you can block five guys. Well, you bring a tight end in, now you can block six guys. So the seventh guy, however many guys you have left, is the guy that you have to put in conflict. And then what about a tight end with a boss out of green-blue? Tight end boss out of green-blue? Well... Are you running with terror motion and you're going to remove somebody, or are you just running 21 personnel stretch? Coach Toro, you're going to have to type in and let me know what you're talking about. We'll jump into the next question here okay. um, while Coach Toro clarifies for us. Oh, actually, he said 21 stretch. 21 stretch, I will tell you that we almost never run that. So as far as creating the conflict player, you're basically going to have to read the eighth guy in the box at this point which goes away from what we want to do. But at the same time, what you're doing is you want to create, for us, when we get into 21, we're going to have at least some type of slot look, so you're going to have a two-receiver side. You want at least three guys out there covering their two guys to even the numbers in the box. All right, Coach. Um, next question here is, do you guys gift the single receiver side on Giants as well? We do, but it's not based. It's based off of the front that they give and the quarterback knowing the system. But normally our base rule when we put in plays, if it's an outside run, the receiver will be blocking or receivers will be blocking. And if it's an inside run is when it becomes gift. 
Now, if we know that they're going to play certain fronts, then we will let the quarterback tag it at the line of scrimmage and throw the quick hitch or the quick out to the single receiver. All right, Coach, um, we're going to do one more question here specific, and then I've got a couple of questions um, overall and philosophy and tempo that we'll jump into. Okay. This next question is, when running Zorro, do you ever tag it to read the backside defensive tackle and run it almost like the midline? We don't, but schools that I have been at have. It is not something that we do. Um, and one for me, like just speaking philosophy-wise, I've never been comfortable with an inside run play midline where both players become inside runners. So for me, that's not something that I've done. Um, to me, if you really have a, a legit quarterback threat, I like it if you do it from wider splits. I know some of the coaches that I've visited that run stuff similar to us and take a lot of our principles. When they have three pl three plus foot offensive line splits, they will run midline off the one technique, not normally off the three, um, and they will keep both guys is inside runners, and they've had some success off of it. But for me, the tighter your splits or the less that your quarterback's an actual runner, no. Um, and mainly because Zorro, the way we teach it with the different rules of the five-man six-box rules, we're not really trying to teach that run play. We want to get really good at our three base run plays against all the fronts that we're going to see. And then our plays four through seven are basically just change-up plays. All right, Coach, excellent. Um, so I've gotten this question a couple of times. Coach, it looks like some of our guys, um, especially our new coaches here, are interested sure. in some help on how do you run tempo. So can you start with telling us um, how do you practice tempo with players that play both ways, and then how do you run tempo with guys going both ways during a game? Okay, so for us, when I put this in at the high school level, and they had won a state title – with like 17, 18, 19 kids. Then we won it again with like 20 kids. Um, and then we've had some, this program's grown, but they've had some success. And I've run it with 22 kids and 19 kids myself and had a lot of success with it, is what you're looking for is building the base system. And then when you find your players that can do certain things, and that's the key, and that's where the coaching comes in, is finding what your kids can do is what's the longest line of any position in football normally? Wide receivers and defensive backs. Well, if you don't have a lot of wide receivers, you have a tight end kid, or you have a linebacker that's a complete asshole, pardon my language, but he's a just complete jerk that likes hitting people, but he's your best player and he's a great hitter, well, put him at, teach him two or three plays out of tight end or teach him two or three plays out of fullback. Now what you do is you have your 10 personnel group and they only learn the 10 personnel plays. But when your slot receiver Y or your slot receiver F get tired, you just change personnel and automatically you go from dual to double or dual to flex and the tight end comes in. And now that's the, the, the only thing the kid learns on offense is Zorro and Giant. So he's going to have a down block or a zone step. So those are the only two things that he's going to learn on offense or you teach him fullback to be run slip or slip read, and now he's got two blocks out of the fullback position, and then a little naked where he ends up in the flat. And now you're subbing your premier players and letting your defensive kids who normally get their rest on offense, or you don't want your top two defensive players on the field at the same time on offense. You put one at the small F and one at the big F, and one's your fullback and one's your slot receiver, and you change personnel based off of them. You don't always have to go at breakneck speed when you only have 20-something kids on your team. Is you, change, you change tempos, but you can still go no huddle, and you can still go to a good tempo. You just change personnel, and you create your personnel packages based off of what guys you have for that time period, and you find who needs rest and who doesn't. Some kids can play the whole game without really ever getting tired, and you can leave them in at corner and wide receiver because they know how to get their breaks. But then you got your linebacker that is not really an offensive player, but you can find a role for him, and now you can get into more of your 20 personnel looks and keep him on the field or get him on the field 
and then your guy that's always going in motion that also has to play safety, you get him some breathers on offense so you can make sure that he's fresh on on defense. And so that's like that's how we always did it is we always created our personnel and would change personnel in game to make sure that we rested certain people during certain periods. And if we score and and at the at the end of the day it's yeah, maybe we score too fast, but you can also get a three and out on defense. Now, as far as practicing, this is always the tricky part, and this is where you got to come up with a system based off of what you have, is we always had the JV practice as a scout team. Now, what we did with that is the JV coaches came and practiced with varsity, and they ran – the, the school's defense. Is our, we put in enough on offense that they could call an I-formation offense just because we had enough words that they could call it and then they would teach them, hey, when I call it this week, you're going to run it from under center. Well, it's the same thing on defense is that we're going to teach them what we want and then the JV or varsity defensive coordinators, you teach the JV kids like, hey, we're going to run quarters this week and you're going to run it and they're going to teach them it in their own words so the kids are learning their defense, and now your varsity coordinator and varsity coaches are getting to see the JV kids or the freshman kids early, and they can start evaluating them for next year or when you bring them up for the playoff run, is we always want to evaluate the next set of kids, so they're always practicing with varsity in some aspect. Now, when you really want to practice your super tempo stuff, is what we do is we, pra we do a lot of stuff on air of practicing three or four plays just in a row as fast as possible, whether it's one word sets all three plays that you're going to run in a row, or you practice your three or four one word plays and you just call them out and the, and the kids do them on air and you just tell them out loud what the front is and the linemen carry it out against the front is that's where you just build it into what you have on hand. But doing it against air is never an issue. As long as the line coach and the skill players are out there and you get the extra coach or the guy that wants to volunteer that just shows up every day but has no idea what he's actually doing. You just tell him where to stand so the quarterback can read him as a conflict player and you just yell at him which direction to go in. Excellent, Coach. All right. Um, next one here. And, Coaches, um, if you guys are new to the system, this is one of the reasons we're doing this webinar. So if you are new and have questions, um, please submit those. But this one comes from Coach Pooler, and he said this is his first year in the system. What concepts do you suggest that he starts with to keep it simple and easy to grasp for the players? Um, to me, you always start with dual is the formation, and then you teach Zorro and Chevron because everything is the same for the linemen and the skill players as far as and the quarterback who they're reading is the linemen know in Zorro it's going to be four down to the mic. If there's a sift or if there's a six defender in the box, the backside tackle knows a sift. Well, in Chevron, and the quarterback knows if it's a five-man box, I'm reading the overhang. Six defender, if he's in the box, I'm still reading him, but I know I'm hot off of him or the defensive end. Well, that takes you right into the pass play because now in the pass pro, it's still four down to mic. If there's six in the box, the tackle will vertical sift instead of going through the line of scrimmage. He will set, and he will either pick up the end if the end comes, but if the backer shoots through the B-gap, then he will sift vertically to him and pick him up, and now the end becomes a hot read for the quarterback to the swing. And now the line is still just four down to Mike, and the, the backside tackle has the same thing, and the quarterback is always reading the overhang defender or the conflict player to the Chevron side or the zone read side, and you're, and you're just reading him, depending on if he's playing run or pass, what he's doing in the, in the run play. Then when it's a pass play, if he plays to the swing, you're throwing the snag. If he sits on the snag, you're throwing the swing. And so to me, you always start with Zorro, key one or key two, at a dual, and then and dual Chevron. That's where you always start with this system because then it makes everything else make sense. For the O-line, for the reads, and for the coaches specifically. Excellent, Coach. All right, we're going to jump back um, and catch up with a couple of questions we got early on that we didn't get to. Um, so this one's from Coach Copeland. He said, is there a disadvantage in running Chevron with the number one wide receiver on the line of scrimmage and the number two off? So that would be the opposite of dual. Well, 
for us, who's on the line of scrimmage and who's off, that has nothing to do with the formation call. Duel to us is a 10 personnel look, and for us it's 10 personnel, but it's a 10 personnel look, 2 by 2. The D tells us it's 2 by 2 formation. Now, who's on and who's off really doesn't matter. What we do, and especially when I was at the high school level, what we did is the Y was always on and the F was always off. What that did was for your outside receivers, because we never have the outside guys switch sides. They're just basically left and right. Now, when the Y came to his side and the Y took the line of scrimmage, that told that outside receiver, okay, I'm off the line of scrimmage, which means I'm Z. Oh, the F is my side. He's off, so I'm on. I'm X. That's how you speed up the teaching initially. But then there are certain routes, like Chevron, you want the Y on because he's got the deeper route and he has to go first because you want the Z to, you're playing in the wake of the Y going vertical and then you're coming underneath him and, and watching the reaction of that Sam or overhang backer. If the Sam carries, he already knows that he's getting the ball. Well, if he's on the line of scrimmage and he's only got a six yard split, he might actually get to that angle faster than the Y can get vertical if the Y is too far off the line of scrimmage. So you want the Y on the line of scrimmage in that. But for me, it's more the teaching principles of when you're putting in the offense of speeding up the teaching for the players. All right, Coach, um, next question here. What tells the QB to throw the key screen versus handing it off? Uh, well, that it's reading the conflict player. So just like dual, if it's a five-man box, you're, the term we use for the quarterback is king, the sixth defender. Well, if, it, if we're declaring that it's a five-man box, all the linemen are going to base, and then, and then the interior. The, for the, or the key side for the quarterback, which is where the back is coming from, if he plays back into his run responsibility because it's a five-man box, he's probably going to have to pick up the B gap in most defenses. Well, if he tries to get back in the box, then you're going to throw the key because then it should be one receiver blocking the cornerback and one receiver running the key screen and then a safety high. But if it's – so, and that's coming from too high. Now, if it's a six-man box – we know the tackle's not going to base the end anymore. He's going to sift through and block the def the linebacker, and that's where the quarterback reads the end. Now, if he reads the end and the end forces the pull by the quarterback, then he pulls and he's running, but he's looking to throw it. So as soon as somebody attacks him, then he throws it back out to the receiver on the key screen, and it becomes triple option. Excellent, Coach. All right. Uh, next question here is, what route do you run out of Giants versus Man? So it, it, in most cases, it stays the same. We, we just normally go into the game plan of tagging somebody on the in-breaking route, and we will tag them with either a seam or a slant, depending on what uh, defense we know we're going to get percentage-wise from the opponent. And then we'll adjust it mid-game depending on what we're getting. All right, Coach. Um, we've got a couple of coaches that have asked for some film here, and I'm not sure if you've got it. I know it's a little, a little bit hard because you don't uh, know what the questions are going to be. Um, but we asked uh, – we got a question about could you show some Chevron and then could you show some Fresno and talk about the conflict player. Okay, uh, Fresno is not going to be discussed. That is actually a members-only thing um, for next week and the week after. That is actually something that we'll be discussing on the site and on the webinar. That's actually on the schedule already. Um, as far as Chevron, I don't have the clips on my computer directly, um, especially if I'd have to run it off the Internet, then it's the, the, it'll be really slow. But for the members, it'll be on the, on the website. There's a teach tape. Um, and most members should have my email address, and we can try to send that out or post that for all for all the members that don't have it. Um, but the the website has all those new teach tapes on it for the run game and the pass game to go over it. Um, I suggest to me there's I think there's like 12 
or 13 different very like things on Chevron on the website. Go through those as much as possible, and if you still have questions, then send them to me. Um, send them directly to me, or post them on the website because that is anybody that knows me or heard me speak at any of the clinics. I always preach: use the website, use the form. There's almost 400 coaching staff members or 400 members of part of this end zone family is we need to use that which means there's probably close to a thousand different coaches that are actually involved with end zone is there's definitely a million different guys to talk to about this and I'm and I try to be on the forum almost every day I know there's some things that I haven't responded to recently but I know like wide receiver splits were a big topic the other day on the website and there's only two posts about it but I know there's a lot of guys that read it, and those are one of those things that we got to get on the website and talk about. So as far as the Chevron question, if you have something direct, um, get my email from uh, Jameson or from the website and send it over to me. If not, throw it up on the forum, and let's discuss it as a group. Yeah, those are great points, Coach. Um, and, guys, this is a good opportunity, too. Um, we, we do have some coaches on that are not members. Um, we know that some of you guys – um, we kind of opened it up. Some of the, you guys that we know have been interested in the system. Wanted to give you a little taste of what you get as a member. Um, next week's webinar will be members only. So all of the members, you guys will get an email from me, and it will also be linked when you log in um, to your system account. Sign up for that one for next week. And then, guys, if you do have questions, um, we've got an email inbox just for questions, and we will get them answered for you, whether it's from Coach Marsh or Bobby Acosta um, or somebody else who runs a system or it's null directly, we will make sure your questions get answered. And you can send that to questions at championshipsystems.com. It's questions at championshipsystems.com. And I'm going to send it to everybody in the in the webinar chat box here to you so you will see it. Um, and then Coach Marsh does make it another good point on the forum, guys. We've got that forum there. It's a great resource for you to bounce ideas and, and ask questions of other coaches that are running the system. And I know that Marsh is on there regularly answering questions as well. So use that forum um, or send us those questions to questions at championshipsystems.com. And if you are not a member currently and you want to be a member, um, send me an email at that questions at championshipsystems.com and we'll tell you how to get signed up so you get access to all this great stuff. Um, Coach Marsh, I've got a couple of quick more questions here. You have time for those? Yeah. Um, one of the coaches, actually I've gotten it from a couple of coaches, asked what's new for 2015. So, Coach, do you want to go over real quick those presentations that we've put up, the teach tapes that are new, um, and tell coaches about those? Um, well, what's new for 2015 is we kind of revamped the website, as you see. Hopefully you've been on it. Uh, it's been reorganized. Um, hopefully you guys are enjoying those that have been on it, uh, have enjoyed the new layout. It's a lot easier to find stuff. Um, I tried to go back through and put it in a certain area so it's a little bit easier for us to think as football guys to find on there as far as like the terminology is concerned. Um, there's teach tapes for almost all the base stuff. I know some of the stuff I haven't gotten up to as far as the pass pro um, is the last of it that's not up, but all the, all the run games up, all the base pass games up. Um, I still got some more run pass option base stuff that has to go up. Um, and then individual presentations off of like what we're looking for in certain looks and how to attack certain defenses will be coming here in the next few weeks. Um, and then off of that, like then of course, like some of the stuff that was at the end zone members only clinics at Glazier of the top gun series or adapting the system to fit your team um, are presentations that will go up. Uh, but to me, the biggest thing for 2015 is the the interaction between myself, Coach Acosta, Coach Mazzoni, and Jameson over at Championship Systems is that we're a lot more accessible. The website's a lot easier to dictate and find on there. And to me, there's so much more on there this year than what was on in the past that to me is use the website and don't, and don't think that something's not on there because mo almost everything that you're going to look for is on there and if it's not let us know so we can build something for it to put up there but um, and I and I say this every time I get on one of these is talk to fellow clients there's a bunch of different client members on here is talk to each other and get to know each other I know there's guys all over the country running this whether it's first year guys running it and winning state titles or guys not putting in any drop back pass plays only running 
run plays with run pass options and then the play action off of those and winning state titles. There's guys at small schools, big schools, really good schools and poor schools that are winning with this. So to me, there's different resources because some of the issues that I face and face here at UCLA are way different than the issues that you guys face. And Coach talks about that all the time and preaches for guys to talk to me is get those questions out there. And to me, the fastest way, and for me, the fastest way for me to respond to them, 90% of the time is a forum because half the time, and it's mainly because of the position that I'm in at UCLA, is I check my email at 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, midnight, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and half the time I don't even realize that I do it. I just mm -hmm. naturally open it and then forget to respond to it because it's not from Coach Mazzoni or Coach Moore, which is normally making my heart race a little bit, making sure I respond to them fast enough. So to me, those are the big things is use the form and use each other and then use all the different teach tapes that are up on the website. Excellent, Coach. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, guys, we've got quite a bit of new stuff on website. Uh, we rolled that out a few weeks ago. Um, but just what Coach Marsh said, if there's something you're looking for, um, we want to hear about it. So if there's something you can't find or if there's a presentation that you would like to see um, or some more explanation, just let us know. We would be happy to either answer your questions on it or put some stuff together for you. We're always looking for good ideas on, on what will help you be more successful in running the system or the parts of the system that you do at your school. Hey, Coach, before we sign off here, can um, we get one more question in? Of course. All right, this is from one of our members who has not uh, been on in a while, Coach Williams. He said, um, can you please explain the difference between shark versus giant? Nothing. Shark is no longer a play in the system. It is not, Shark and giants are now one play. In the old days, shark was without a tight end to tell the linemen that there was a tight end in the game. Now they just, they just learn it with the tight end in the game or out of the game. It's just one play. In the old days, it was Giants had the tight end, and that's the way you ran it with a tight end, and Shark was without. It's now just one variation. Excellent, Coach. Um, several coaches wrote in, wanted to say thank you. Um, thank you to you and Noel for the great presentation. Coach Boyd wanted you to know that uh, he thinks Noel should send you to Hawaii to recruit and stop by St. Louis School first. First beer's on him. Um, if it's St. Louis, I'm in because I want to learn some of the run and shoot so I can bring back some of those option routes back here. Yeah, so we... I'm in. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, again, thank you very much for everybody that attended. We did record this webinar. So if there was something you missed or you got on late, um, it will be up on the site for members. Usually takes us um, about 48 hours. So I expect it will be up by Monday. Um, so if you want to go back, watch this webinar, listen to everything, listen to the questions and review um, you will have that option as an end zone member. And again, please um, email us questions at championshipsystems.com. We'll make sure your questions get answered and uh, let us know if there's anything else that you're looking for um, to help you run the end zone more successfully. Coach Marsh, really appreciate all your time tonight. Coach, anything you want to leave these guys with? Uh, play fast. There we go. In, in the famous words of Noel, play fast, my friend. <laughs> it's time for a drink. There we go, Coach. All right, signing off for Championship Systems and In and Zone System. Thank you, everybody. You still there?